Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Square Booksellers on Sunday awaiting a big snowstorm mm. and uh, we're supposed to get maybe four, six, eight, ten. They're not sure how much snow we're getting today. Feet? Feet? No, <laughs> not feet. You know, maybe two feet. We're not sure, but it's one o'clock so we're safe right now. And we're here with Tom Fontaine who's into his third book on the series of what might have happened to grafted individuals when they participated in the American Civil War. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you, Tom. Thank you all. It's kind of fun to be able to do this with a small little audience, which makes my day, because I don't do this for a regular, uh, on a regular basis, but I do talk to kids on a regular basis. Can I look at Same you guys? difference. I'll just, yeah. I'll just look at you as kids. So my third book. Um, this book took it took me on an adventure when I decided that I wanted to write this book. The book is about two individuals from Grafton. So what I'm going to try to do is talk about the book it's first, because the book is historical fiction. But then I'll give you the backstory, which is always fun, because it's the real life deal of these two individuals that I'm going to, I'm going to talk about. So the first about the book itself. The book started to take shape way back when I wrote my first one, um, back in the 90s, because there was a character in my first book and he had just a small part. He was actually in my second book too. His name was Dr. Cassinus B. Park Jr. And Dr. Cassinus B. Park lived in Grafton. He was pretty young to be a doctor in his early 20s. And he has practice in Grafton. He, he came from Weston, where his parents uh, lived for a bit, but then they came over to Grafton because the relatives uh, originated Grafton in the 1700s. So the parks have been around Grafton forever. Mm. So he came back and got his practice. Um, the other character in the book is Edward Pettengill. Edward is about the same age, and I'll tell you some backstory about Edward that I think you'll find is pretty cool. Edward, again, his relatives originated Grafton, uh, 1700s, have been around forever in Grafton. And I really, in my heart and soul, wanted to write a story about these two individuals. But I knew that if I was gonna write this story, that I had to do a ton of research. The research I had to do was because of the medical part of it. So back in the Civil War time, medicine, and of course Dr. Lettman will be able to help me with this, as I conferred with him on the book, I sent him the manuscript <laughs> twice, <laughs> of which he gave me some incredible feedback. Um, my brother Brian helped me with feedback as well. There, there was a lot of terms a lot of procedures that took place during the Civil War, medical-wise, that I didn't understand. When they talked to me, Dr. Lettman included, I said, talk to me down here. <laughs> Don't use any big medical terms. Because the book is really geared for people at a, at a juvenile age, so, you know, late teenagers. I started to really enjoy researching about the medicine. To take that information and put it into a story and to make it appealing was, was challenging. I started to enjoy it even more so when those procedures that took place, I was able to actually understand as I wrote it. So 
we all think of, um, when you think of the Civil War being as brutal as what it was, medicine-wise, it was brutal as well because there was no sanitary um, ways of doing procedures. So for a, they just, they didn't know about germ warfare. They didn't know about germs. They knew about infections, but not about germs per se. And these doctors would do these procedures and wipe their instruments and not think anything about it. It was just a way that they practiced. But I wanted to give the reader um, the understanding that not all doctors were that way during the Civil War. There were some doctors who had dignity in, in what they performed. And I felt Dr. Park was one of them. By reading a couple of letters that I actually researched, I could tell that he had a um, a strong bond with the soldiers, with the people that he took care of. And it was very evident when I would read some of the correspondence with, with some of the other soldiers who were writing about Dr. Park. And it, it warmed my heart. And in the book itself, I tried to bring that out, that Dr. Park was a very compassionate person as well as a surgeon. He, in the story, it's, he really goes on these amazing adventures, as I call them, where he has to do a lot of different procedures. So I didn't want to just focus on amputation. Amputation was big back then. Mm -hmm. It's how they got rid of infection, cut it off, you know, and hopefully they'll, they'll be all right. Um, I tried to focus on other um, parts of medicine that would have been used during the Civil War in this story field, in the story that I'm putting in my mind, how can you do that and make it appealing? As you guys know, and Dr. Lepman especially, that when operations take part, when surgery takes part, it can be pretty gory to uh, people that don't know much about it. I didn't want to bring that out, but I wanted to give the reader the understanding that, you know, it, it wasn't all, it wasn't all play, but it wasn't all gory and blood and guts. So that was a challenge, especially with the amputation. One of the things that I learned with the amputation part of it is that these surgeons were so skilled at amputations that it took them no more than eight minutes to amputate a limb. I found that to be mind-boggling. Sharp instrument to be able to do that. Um, the other part of medicine during this time that intrigued me was the whole herbal part of it. You know, these, these patients, um, to give them mercury to give them some of these other medicines that we now look at and say now that's taboo that's poison but they were turpentine with another one totally blew me away when i <laughs> giving this patient i think it was for a cough dr wetman turpentine yeah. yeah for for a chronic cough i was just stunned and the other thing that comes out in here, and as you read the book, you'll hear me throwing these in, um, plugs of opium. So they gave out opium like we give out aspirin. It was amazing. Tylenol. Tylenol. <laughs> Not even aspirin, aspirin anymore. Now. Tylenol, Advil. Mm -hmm. You know, they were giving out opium to patients, you know, for chronic coughs, for aches and pains. It was amazing. And of course, nowadays with this whole heroin epidemic, these guys were giving it out like it was nothing to it. That intrigued me. That inspired me to go, all right, I want to go a step further 
where I want to talk a little bit about the herbs that were used, but I also want to pull in this other character. So Dr. Park had all of these um, things that he had to know. He wasn't just a doctor, but he also was a person that understood herbs. Now I pull in the other character, um, Edward Pettengill. So in the story, Dr. Park uh, gets a message from the governor of Vermont at the time, and he wants Dr. Park to sign on with a volunteer unit, uh, the 16th, as their head surgeon. Dr. Park says, yes, I'll take it on, and now I get to pick my hospital steward. So a hospital steward, what, it, what are they? What's a hospital steward back in the day of the Civil War? It was a hand-chosen person, male, that did all of the things that a nurse would do now. So a hospital steward was the person that possibly cooked in the hospitals. Hospital steward was a person that cared for the patients after the procedures were done. So when Dr. Park did a, a procedure of some sort, the hospital steward would be the one to maybe stitch up that person afterwards, look after them, care for them, administer drugs. So the hospital steward could have been what's called a pharmacist nowadays. Doctor, not doctor, but Edward Pettengill, who would become a doctor. Um, Edward was that person. And I hand chose Edward, Dr. Park hand chose Edward because they didn't live far apart from each other. And that's the way I portrayed it in the story, is, is this Edward Pettengill character had a liking for medicine and Dr. Park asked him if he would sign on as the hospital steward. It intrigued me because as I'm, as I'm writing this, I'm thinking, isn't this ironic? I've got Edward Pettengill, who is a hospital steward in my book, and this person has the responsibility of a nurse and a pharmacist. My sister's a nurse, my brother's a pharmacist. <laughs> I went, wow, this is, this is pretty ironic that we would go that route. I wanted these guys um, to go on an adventure and, and what I tried to bring out with the two characters was a mentorship that Dr. Um, Park would have been looked at as a mentor by Edward and I wanted Edward to be more inspired with these different procedures that he was asked to do um, in the book. I wanted Edward to start off in the book very apprehensive because he had never done these sort of procedures, stitch someone, um, possibly give them whatever drugs needed to be given. I wanted him to be very apprehensive but then throughout the book I wanted him to be um, more sure of himself. I wanted the confidence in him to build as the story went on. And I did that purposely. I did that purposely because after the war, after Edward signed up for his nine months, uh, he went on to become a doctor and a very famous doctor in our small little town of Saxons River. And Dr. Pettengill, Edward, I can only feel inside was inspired by Dr. Park during these nine months that they spent together. Um, during their journey of, of being a doctor, surgeon, and a hospital steward. So this book will take you on this adventure that, that goes in that direction where Dr. Park has all of these things that he needs to do and Edward follows along and Dr. Park starts giving him more responsibility, more responsibility, but asking him are you okay with this? Are you okay with this? And finally, I think at the end, I think you'll enjoy it. The, uh, I won't tell you that. No, <laughs> don't tell them. But I think you'll enjoy it. There, 
There's another part of Dr. Park that I tried to bring out in the book, and that is his, his oath of becoming a doctor. So Dr. Park, when he took his oath to be a doctor, and Dr. Letman, you, you remember probably when, when you took the oath of being a doctor, right. the responsibility of care for humans is what the oath comes down to, is taking care of human beings. Now you've got this Dr. Park who has just signed on with the Union. And these Confederates are fighting. I want you to be aware of this because of what I'm trying to give Dr. Park the image. Because there's a couple parts in it where he has to take care of, and he doesn't have to, some Confederates. He also has to take care of some slaves who were injured. So I want you to take notice, if you would, and please write to me on the back, especially Lana over there, you mm -hmm. write to me or have your, your um, granddaughter, granddaughter mm -hmm. write to me and tell me, did I get that message across that Dr. Park was a very compassionate and a very understanding person and he wanted to fulfill uh, his oath of being a doctor and taking care of humans, not just the union. So I want, I want to try to bring that out and hopefully I have in the story itself. In the end of it, I think with some of the scenes, you should be able to get an understanding of what Dr. Park is all about, which, which I think you will. There's a lot of adventure, there's a lot of action, there's a lot of characters that you may recognize their name. Um, so every once in a while when you write a historical fiction book to put in a name of a soldier, you know, you might throw somebody in there like a McCormick or, or Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Okay. And I had to warn him ahead of time. Okay. Um, Gary's been in all three of my books. Okay. And, and his last comment to me was, and I called him like last week, and he said, why do you always want to kill me off? <laughs> and I said, I don't. But that's the fun part about writing historical fiction books. The fun part about it is you create a story woven around some true life characters, true life ones in Grafton. Um, Please take notice of the illustration. This is not something I got from a magazine. Um, Noreen Sands, a Grafton resident, drew this freehand. So it is the Vermont flag of the regiment that he was part of with the amputation kit underneath. So she drew this freehand, which was really, really cool. I think you'll like it. Now, backstory. This is the fun part about writing are these two characters were real people. Dr. Park was a real doctor in Grafton, was a real doctor in the 16th Regiment. I don't know about his, his um, I'm not sure where he got his degree finally, but I think it was somewhere in Albany, New York. There was an Albany Medical School um, and I think that Edward followed in his footsteps after the war itself. Cool part about it is in Grafton, there is one remaining park. There are no more Pettengills. Although I've connected with several of the Pettengill family who live in Alaska. So Edward, just out of a coincidence, I mean a sheer off the cuff, this woman wanted some information about her family, knew that it was from Grafton, and wrote to the museum looking for information, and they referred her to me. And we had a great correspondence. It was her great grandfather, oh, that's awesome. which was yeah. Edward. That is awesome. And she had no idea that there was a book. And I said, the second book is about your great uncle, Sam Pettengill, who was Edward's brother. She was flabbergasted. And she wants to come back this summer nice. to go to the family plot. Yeah. So I thought that was very moving for me. In all three of my books, 
I have connected with all of the characters' ancestors, and some of them just by sheer coincidence, which is absolutely gives me more um, mojo to just find more people that are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'll keep writing, but <laughs> to keep researching so I can find more, more relatives. In Grafton, Arthur Park is the remaining soul. He's who we know, right? Yeah, we, yeah, we know him. Oh yeah, yeah we all know him. We, yeah. <laughs> Arthur is the the soul Park, the only one living in Grafton. Martha Derosia, who was my first grade teacher, was a Park. So it was, it was pretty cool, and I actually went to the farm. Um, Martha's deceased now, and her husband still owns the farm, and it's the Park Farm. And I went and did a, a segment with Alex at Fact TV on site at the farm, and I was like, "This is so moving. It's, it is. <laughs> it's so cool to be able to mm -hmm. go out on this Park family, you know, and just be able to talk about the Civil War." I haven't connected with Arthur yet. Arthur is Arthur. <laughs> yes. And I haven't, I told him, I actually called him and said, do you mind if I mention you in the book, in the forward of the book? Because I didn't want to just put his name in there yeah. and not mention it. And he said, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I said, it's kind of ironic that, you know, I'm writing this book about medical men. And I said, you were a medical person in the Vietnam War. And he told me all about wow. the regiment and where he, you know, did his time during the Vietnam War, which is pretty cool. My distant relative. Uh, the the Pettengill. This one, this one was a mind blower to me. When I wrote my second book, I wanted to find where these people lived, so I have found where where Dr. Park lived. I knew just by a person telling me where he lived. I was excited, I went there, there's a house on the property, but I'm able to look out and it's beautiful. The Pettengill, Edward. Edward I didn't know. I'm like, he actually, after the war, got his degree and became a, a small town doctor in Saxons River for his entire life. Pretty neat, gotta have a house there. I found an old picture of Dr. Pettengill as an old man sitting in a carriage in front of his house. And I was working in Saxons River doing carpentry two summers ago. And the guy that owns the house, Tim Clark, that I was doing work for, he was a teacher at Kern Hatton and friends of mine. And I went to his house early one Saturday morning because we were going to look over his job that he wanted done at his house. And I said, we got to find this house. I said, I got a picture. And he's like, what is it? And I said, this Dr. Pettengill's house. And I said, my, my character, Sam, from my second book, and my character that's going to be in my third book, they live together as old men out here in Saxons River, and I got to find them. I said, I want to find the house. And I got a picture of them. We're walking around Saxons River, Tim and I cup of coffee, mm -hmm. going down Pleasant Street, Academy Ave, we're looking at houses, I've got the picture. You know, I go, geez, it's got to be here somewhere. I mean, this guy was a doctor for ever in this small little town. We go back to his house, I go, all right, time out, cancel it. I said, let's go look at your house and do the gig. All of a sudden, I start looking at Tim and he looks at me and he goes, you know, I bet you the house burned. And I go, you think? He goes, well, look at my house. He goes, my house had a fire in it in the 1950s, and they did this whole top to the house. You, you can't even recognize my you know, house from the 50s to where it is now. I go, no way. <laughs> I go, you got to be kidding me. I go, Tim, it's your house. <laughs> and he goes, no, it's not my house. I go, look, the bay window. That's your house right there. I'm standing looking at it. Tim goes, I got the deed inside. He goes, I'll go in and find out. I go, text me on the way home. I didn't get out of Saxon's River. He calls me, he goes, 
Dr. Pettengill's house. Oh, that, is, that is unbelievable. For six weeks, I walked around doing work in Dr. Pettengill's house. My character and Sam. I was, I was like, I was walking on air, you know. I, I redid this laundry room for him, and I'm pounding nails, and I'm like looking on the ground because there was no basement in it for this one section, and I'm looking, and I'm like. To find something that says like Dr. Pettengill. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, but I, there are some old relics that I kept, and it was absolutely flabbergasting that I could work in this same house. So I started to do a little more research. I so said, Dr. Pettengill lives here in Saxons River. He's buried here. He's got the family plot. I'm like, I'm gonna go up, look around the family plot. Yep. The two Civil War brothers are buried in the same plot. I said, this is pretty neat. I come back and I go, now I'm... my character Sam, from my second book, he died in this house. He died being taken care of by, by, his, by Edward's daughters. I'm like, those two daughters must have been saints to take care of their uncle until he died. Edward had passed away. Here I am researching them. Thank God for the internet. Mm -hmm. One of them, teacher at Kern Hatton Homes. No. <laughs> Same place that I teach. I was like, that is mind blowing to me. It is. And it just kept me going and going and going. So I've, it's, been a, it's been a journey writing these, but it's what is the spooky part is the aftermath. You know, relatives getting in touch with me, being able to talk with them personally, um, being able to meet them. I met the Springs from my first book. I just think it's powerful. I think it's it really is. powerful. Mm -hmm. and it's powerful for them too. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of them, from my second book, the other character in my second book, um, Wilder Burnett, Again, out of a clear blue, I'm driving home two months ago. I'm driving home, I don't even know where I was coming from, and I get an email, I'm checking my email, I'm like, well, I'm driving, I know. <laughs> but you know, I'll, my phone's right up here, and I just hit the email, and, and it's this last name, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, well, I don't know who it is. And she leaves me a number, and she says, if you get a chance, I'd like to speak with you about your second book. I'm like, all right. So I call her up. Oh, pull you were off. Driving? I pull off. <laughs> <laughs> Lana, I wouldn't do that. No, yeah. no, I pull off on the side of the road and I call the number because I'm kind of, you know, I'm intrigued. And she says, I am so and so Burnett. And I went, really? She goes, yeah, I just found out by, she goes, my husband has a lot of ancestors and he's doing a lot of research. So I decided to do a lot of research and I plugged in my ancestor's name, Wilder Burnap, and your book came up wow. on the internet. <laughs> so I wanted to get the book. I got the book and on the back, I found your email. She goes, this is unbelievable to see the Burnap name in print yeah. with a story. She goes, thank you. Thank you. And I said, it's just one of those things that is the world is just too small yeah, to be able to see wonderful. that. But it's really, really intriguing. But getting back to this book, I think from the, from the start, as Marge Adams said, when you read a book, you want it to be a page turner where you just want to read yeah. the next yeah. and the next and the next. And hopefully, hopefully you will. Hopefully you'll enjoy it but it's a lot of medical. So I had to, I wrote to Dr. Lettman probably two, three times, called him on the phone. Uh, my brother Brian, I said, just tell me some of these procedures. <laughs> yeah. Tell me why they would do this. And hopefully I got it right in the book. We'll okay. see. We'll see. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you'll be fine. You, you got my email. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, so questions. Is this okay for an 11 year old? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, as, um, as Lynn Park put it, Lynn Park was an ancestor of Dr. Park, 
And as Lynn Park put it to me, she said, I like the way that you told the story without getting too gory. Okay. But it yeah. gave the reader enough yeah. information where they could surmise in their mind. So for an 11 year old girl, I think what she sh should be able to get out of it is that war, you know, is, isn't what people think it might be. It's, it can be a lot worse, but. Have you tried it out on your students yet? I have not. Oh. <laughs> I have not. I, I think we talked in one of your other times about how they respond to your, your stories, so it'll be interesting to see how that I, works for you. I wished, so I, I did the first book when it first came out with my students at Kern Hatton, and I actually, uh, have you read the first one? I haven't, but I'm going to bring them back from Vivian. She has them. Yeah. She'll give them to me. You, uh, them. You've got to read the first one. I want one. to, yeah. Because I was videotaping, as I'm reading I, this one part, which is the end of the book, and I wanted to videotape the expressions to see if I got the point across to the kids. And I did. Oh. And I did. Um, I won't tell you what, because I don't want to ruin it. Well, but she, she, she loved them. And I, as soon as that Tammy told me that you had another call, so I talked to Celeste and said, what do you think? You know, it, it might have some parts. And she said, well, why don't you get it and read it? But, yeah. but she so loved those first two yeah. that I gave her. And, and I'm now I'm going to read it. I think if you read it, there, you know, there are some parts. But I always tell, especially my students, I said, the, what I want you to do is, is, yes, there's a whole plot to it. And, but I want you to analyze the characters. When you read it, follow the characters from the beginning to the end. Because, you know, you're my feedback. Tell me, do you see, you know, the, where, where there's a part that just is like, there's your character right up there. And bringing it down, you know, so that you have these humps where it's exciting as ever and then, okay. And then exciting. And, you know, throughout a good book, that's, that's what I try to uh, bring out. She would love that. We took her... She informed us, she comes and stays with, with us about a week in the summer by herself. And, and uh, we see her a lot more than that, but for that time, by herself. And she came and she said, well, it seems to me, maybe, she calls me, that um, there's a lot more history where you live than there is over here in New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> and I've found that it smells better in Vermont. <laughs> well, uh, where you live is really pretty rural. I, I, I don't think it smells different, but I, okay. But she's fascinated, so we went out to Sassen River mm -hmm. because she had heard about um, Pettenberg. Yep. I want to find where the, that cemetery is, well, Rick sure. So we drove her out. There's someone else there who also was, had, I don't know if he was a general or not, he would be young of an F. It's in another part of the cemetery. So she knew that one, and there was actually a picture of it online. So. I took that my um, phone with me, and so I could see what the stone looked like. Well, I think the pictures of the cemetery were taken before some of the newer parts. So I was way off where we were supposed to be for an hour and a half. We walked and we walked to Rick and me and Vivian uh, everywhere, and we couldn't find them. So Rick got tired of that. He went back to the car, and so I said, "I'm not. I'm not leaving here. If you want to go home with Papa, I will drive you home. I'm coming back until I find it." And so no, 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 she wanted to stay. So we found one, but it wasn't Pettengill. And then she, she, Rick got out and went down to look at the map of the cemetery. Exactly. Well, it didn't help. I mean, they couldn't find anything. So she said, but I really want to find one. I just have, I saw her coming. I just happened to turn like this, and there it is, Pettengill. Mm -hmm. So I was wildly waving, and she came running up. She was so excited. I took pictures of her in front of it. That is so And funny. then we found the other Send them one. to me. I want to see that. I will if I still have them. If not, I'll have to catch up with you because Larry knows where all these really, really old cemeteries are from hunting and fishing. Yeah, like, he would. Really old. And he's going to take, I said, you got to take me and Vivian because I don't know where you're talking about. Like uh, Popple Dungeon has a really old Sure. Mm -hmm. And sure. You know, he said, mm -hmm. wow, we're not there. Because really, you know, I think the oldest, have you been to the Charlestown Cemetery? I have not. Mom and I went there not too long after Dad passed away three years ago, and um, it was Memorial Day weekend, so I took her up. We have relatives there, and I said, well, if you feel like it, let's walk up back. We found a minister from Charlestown who was buried up there before the Revolutionary War. Oh, wow. So I was like, this is the oldest one I've ever seen, you know, and I read all of it, everything around it. It was 
fascinating. They have some very old ones, but way up at the top. I love some of the cemetery. Me too. We've Reading. been. Mm -hmm. Vivian and I went down to Westminster. I had never been to the old cemetery. Oh yeah. I had never been there. Yeah. So and Dad's buried at the uh, newer cemetery in Westminster. So she wanted to go there, and we walked all around that. And then we went to the other one. She loves the Civil War, and she was so excited about oh, Hattingen. Cool. To finally found, find it, you know, I was excited because we, we were just about ready to give up. I said, I'm coming back then. I'll come back after you go home. And I'm that not going to leave till I like, find it. So it was awesome. And the other one is farther up. We had a hard time finding that because the picture of it, of the plan of the cemetery, really didn't cover like I was expecting. Yeah. I think it showed the newer part, and maybe I just missed it. I don't know, but I we, we spent an hour and a half there, and it was so I just, worth it. I connected with Averill at the store. Right, yeah. And I, I didn't know, I, kn I knew Averill um, as Averill Thompson. I didn't know that she was a Sacramento <coughs> River person. Oh, oh yeah, yes. yeah, big family. And I was just <laughs> blown away. Well, Sean Campbell. Yeah, yeah. Sean and I were the only um, two pallbearers for Art Smith and so I got to meet oh, him yeah. as a young you know I was young yeah. at the time and we were the only non-fireman yeah. for Art Smith and I got to know Sean through that well here's Averill sitting outside with Sean didn't connect to me <laughs> I went inside and I was talking I was like is that her husband is that her you know I don't know I know Sean and I know Averill in Saxon's River if in doubt somebody is a sibling of Averill Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I was blown house. away. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. she knew the Pettengills. She's like, oh, really? oh yeah. Mm -hmm. She goes, my grand, my grandfather or her father was a hundred years old, not, died. Yeah. not yeah. too long yeah. ago. And she's yeah. like, oh yeah, the Pettengills. They, and I'm looking at her, and I'm like, you know, Doctor Pettengill died in the 19 early 1900s. And she goes, well then he must have had a son that was a doctor. <laughs> sure enough. Did she happen to know, did you ask her if she actually knew where the house was before you found it? No. Dr. Pettengill? No. no. I never asked her. I knew where the house was what, Oh, prior. by then. Yeah. 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 I just barely connected with Averill probably two months yeah. ago out there. She's, she's, she's a wealth yeah. of information. I was going to say, I yeah. bet she is. Wow. But yeah. I was like, you know, small world. Small world. Does... Um, Doctor, I think his first name was Edward James from Waterbury. Turn up in your book. I think, I think in our correspondence, I may have mentioned him. He was a, uh, a senior medical officer and from Vermont. He was from Waterbury, Vermont. I didn't. Who um, was quite active at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, and then stayed on to set up the field hospital that was set up at Gettysburg for people who were wounded there, which remained in, in place for quite a while yes. after the battle. Yes. And uh, uh, among various other things, in, in the fall of 1863, when they decided to have the, to set up the cemetery at, at Gettysburg and had a dedication ceremony, mm -hmm. he was on the platform. And of course, there was an orator who spoke for about two hours, and then they finally let the President of the United States speak for about three minutes. Right. right. Uh, and which is the one that everybody has memorized. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dr. Dr. James was there on the platform. Wow. Lincoln, Small world. No, I mean. He, um, he, he's quite, uh, quite well remembered, and he, he returned to Waterbury and was a, a surgeon also was on the faculty at the University of Vermont. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, when I was a medical student at the University of Vermont, I was working with a doctor in the Burlington area, and two older women, I, at the time I would have said elderly, but well, I'm old enough now. That <laughs> we, we don't say that they anymore, were, do They we? were older than I am now. They uh, came into the office to be checked for something or other, and I was there with with them and with the doctor, and he said to me afterwards, he said, well, the, these ladies um, have a history that goes back some distance. Their, their father was a, uh, um, a surgeon uh, here in, in Burlington for a long time. It happened that he had written, a, their father had written a memoir of his life as a surgeon in Burlington, oh, wow. and he told about working with Dr. Jaynes, who had come from, you know, after the Civil War had settled down in the area and was kind of a curmudgeonly old guy, but very well respected. 
And so here I was talking with somebody whose father had known this doctor who was at Gettysburg. Yep. And you, so wow. you're, you, these, you're, you're talking about connections that yeah. way. A lot but, of connections. Uh, uh, you just bump into them. Yeah. It, mm. it, it, I don't know. It's, I call it spooky in that just out of a clear blue. Yeah. You know? All that from just this one book or three books. Three books. And three it's, books. it's pretty cool. The other thing I didn't mention about Dr. Park is in eight, after the Battle of Gettysburg, um, August of that same year, he mustered out. So he, he got done. He did his nine month volunteer. They, um, the, the doctor or the governor of Vermont at the time needed another surgeon for a new regiment that was just starting up. It was a, um, it was a heavy artillery regiment and he conferred with Dr. Park about signing on. We need you to sign on because the regimental surgeon that we have for the 11th just abruptly quit. So that's how I end the book is whether or not he will take the job or not. And you'll have to read it to find out whether he does or not. Okay. It'll, it'll make you think. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'll make you think what this guy was about. And I think you'll be, I think you'll be floored at what he decides, Dr. Park. The other thing that I thought was very interesting, backstory, is Dr. Pettengill was the private physician of Hetty Green. Really? Oh, nice. Yeah, he was the private physician. Of I Hedy bet Green. you didn't pay him. Much. And, and you know something? That's what it says in the history books. That he was the private doctor of Hetty Green. And then a little notation underneath I'm not sure whether he got paid or not. The yeah. woman actually wrote it. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I think it was in his obituary, actually. Do you think, you know, I often think, how many kids in this area? know about Daniel Kilburn and that stone over there. You know Daniel Kilburn? I do. Yeah. Well, you know. He, there's With that, the Indians? Yeah. Yep. He's, there's a stone over there, like sort of across from where the Jiffy Mart is yep. right there. I dragged my granddaughter over there, too, and I've told her twice now about the battle that he had there. And about, and then we took her up to the, what? I don't think I've seen the stone. Oh, you yeah, there Walpole. is. It's right out there. Yeah, right yeah, out. It's, like, it's actually, I think it's a bronze plaque on a boulder. Well, it is. It's a boulder. It's, it's not route really. 12. Yeah, it's like right along Route 12. You can't. Okay. Right been there, there for, it's been there for a very long well, time. From my childhood, I think. Oh, long, much longer. It's because it, it's, 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 <laughs> Lanning, you're only it's 50. Even been there since my childhood. No, uh, no it's uh, it's photographed. It's pictured, for example, in that uh, book, which I think you still have available in reprint of pic photographs of this area, uh, published around 1900 or 1910 or so. So it it was installed in the late 19th, early 20th century. So, I mean, I, you know, we did get it or something of that in school, obviously a long time ago. So I took her over there and said, you know, but my kids didn't ever hear about that. I sure. took them over there too. <laughs> you have to go see this, you know, and explain what I read about it, what had happened. And then we took Vivian up to the Walpole Inn. Right. I said that was the safe place. And, you know, she was uh, just fascinated by it. Yeah. You know, it's one There's so the, much history. Yeah. When you start the kids, uh, They yeah. don't know it. The meeting house. I would, well, obviously, I was married there, you were there. Yeah. And do you remember, by the way, you weren't very old. No, I wasn't. Really like good. seven, maybe. eight. Yeah, maybe. I know. And I actually walked down the aisle with the rings. Yes, he did. That's like highly unusual. The rings. real rings, but not worried about them going through. I never thought about them going through the <laughs> Oh, well, it all the time. Yeah, <laughs> not to me. I mean, oh, yeah, I never awesome. thought of it. Well, they were tied on, though. So. I remember it. I got yeah. pictures. <laughs> Your Dr. Pettengill probably worked with um, Dr. Hill, who was Ethel's father. Oh, right. I don't know. He was roughly contemporary. He's a little later than Dr. Pettengill would have been because he didn't come there until the 1880s. Ethel was born, I think it was in 1889. Their father was already Dr. Practiced. Pettengill got done in, the, in 1900. Yeah. And so, he was uh, sick. And it crushed him to tell his patients that he could no longer look after him and he died a short time after. Yeah. So Dr. Hill was after that? Dr. Hill would have been somewhat after that but would have coincided with him. He, sure. he was there by the end of the 1880s or so and um, 
He was, I think he first worked in Saxons River. I think Ethel was born in Saxons River. But uh, then he then he moved into town and was okay. next door to, to well, McGurr's, well, right. where, where the daycare yes. now is. Yeah. I knew Ethel. Yes, you, I we mean, all uh, knew the only, Ethel. Yeah. Everybody knew well, I, Ethel. Yeah. I knew the name. I, you, know, I was, you didn't either? No. Ethel with the big Ethel. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, yes I did. I mean, we talked about, talk about, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. talk about Hetty yeah. Green not probably wanting to pay terribly much for the medical mm -hmm. services. Uh, um, um, I think Ethel had taken tight lessons from Hetty Green. Yeah. But, <laughs> she goes so far. She was Hetty, uh, Ethel couldn't understand why I needed to charge more than 50 cents for an office visit and a dollar for a house yeah, call because that's what her father had gotten. And she talked about her father. She actually kind of bragged about it. And I went, the women's club had this thing where all these older ladies, older than me now, um, maybe. Um, went to all these historical places in this area, like there was the Underground Railroad up at the Country Club and up, one up on Rockingham. Uh, yep, that house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everything, <laughs> you remember Ann Davis? Sure. And I were the runners. I mean, we helped them out of the cars and in the cars and went back and get their lunch. We were just the young ones. And so we were tagging along all the time and we would just sit there unless someone asked us to do something. And we started to realize that anything that any, any one of these ladies brought up, Ethel already knew more than that and already had done more than that. It was just all the time, Ethel with her big hats and her gloves. But she, we found her to be so delightful. The other ladies maybe were annoyed with her, but we thought it was like, listen to her stories. Yeah. You know, it, it just I wish I her. had well, taken more in from the older people oh, yeah, to Alice, listen. Alice, Alice, Alice Hawks, of oh, course. That would have been awesome. Oh. That would have been to be able to videotape that. Oh yeah. Wow. No, there, there were. Yeah, big time. Sure. Oh. I'd be honored to. Can you write your name here? No, you don't have to. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. Sounds interesting. I'm a nurse, so I'm curious to oh. <laughs> get the historical perspective. Of I think you'll enjoy it. I hope. Please write to me afterwards. Hello, I'm Christine Kelly. I'm related to Pat Kelly. Oh, please to meet you, Christine. Yeah. I met you four years ago, back in the early Keep going. I mean, good In the early days. Yeah, I was in a little fun. Back when you were in high school. Well, I'm not that Awesome. Thank you. I look Thank forward you. to reading it. Awesome. I'm please write to me after. Let me know. So do you have anything else in mind for to the write? other book? I don't. No, I actually, no, I, I said it the last time that I uh, I said at the last, PK was here, my last talk here, and he said, are you going to write any more? And I said, I'd, I'd like to get this one out. And he said, what about the one about your brother? Yeah, I heard. And, Tammy had said something. Yeah, and I said, you know, it, it would be wonderful to put that in, in, in publication, just to be able to make my brother a movie. Because he was, as you know, mm -hmm. you know, he was my um, be my super. hard to do. I've often thought of you once Tammy had just mentioned.